Hello, my name is Aviva, and today I'm going to be starting my A Court of Thorns and Roses series reread reading vlog. So I actually already read the first book in the series. I've actually already read the entire series two times. I'm in the middle of my third round of rereading the entire series, and I decided that I'm going to vlog it for you, mostly because I just finished vlogging my Thorn of Glass reread. I just finished reading that series for the third time, so I'll have that video linked down below in case you want to check it out. I also just made a How to Read the Thorn of Glass series in case you wanted to check that out also but my point is is that I am now starting my reread of this series and I decided to just continue with the pattern and vlog it for you guys so what I plan to do is at the end of each book I'm just going to come on here and share with you my very simple thoughts like I'm not going to go too deep into it I just kind of want to share with you what I thought this time around of rereading it so therefore this vlog is going to be very spoilery but you know it is what it is I kind of don't know how to make vlogs non-spoilery because like what else am I supposed to share with you you know but either way I'm um, if you're cool with that, let's keep watching and actually get into what I thought of book one. So this time around, I actually listened to it via audiobook, mostly because, first of all, I just listened to the entire Throne of Glass via audiobook. And usually when I listen to Throne of Glass, I will go back and forth between like physical and audio. But this time around, I kind of just wanted to do the entire thing with audio for some reason, because I really do like the narrator for that, like for those books. So I did it that way. So I, once I started at guitar, I'm like, oh, I'm kind of in like the audio book mood. So let's try the audiobook for this one. And unfortunately, I did not like the narrator as much for book one as I did for Throne of Glass. But the thing is, I still wanted to listen to it only via audio because I just knew that if I picked this book up, like physically, I would end up skimming it. And I really don't want to have the urge to skim it. But I just know that if like I wanted to get through book one so that I could really go and enjoy book two, like every time I reread the Akatar series, like I'm really just reading it for like A Court of Mist and Fury. Like that is for sure my favorite book from the series. And like, I like the rest of the series. Like I really do love it, but like I love the entire Throne of Glass series like way, way more. So like when I'm rereading this series, like I really just want to like enjoy like Feyre and Rysand's like, you know, scenes and everything like that. So like, I really just want to read Akmath. And therefore I didn't want to skim Akhtar. So I read it via audio and I am happy that I did it that way. Even though, like I said, I really did not enjoy the audio book as much only because like, like the way that like she would say things like I just I say it differently in my head and it's like she would pronounce things like she would like stress things in like a different way that I would stress it when I know that I was reading the book like I just you know you read it in a different way than you listen to it and for some reason like the throne of glass books like though that that works for me the way that the narrator does it but this way like I didn't like it as much also because like I say a lot of the names differently like Resand versus Rysand like I say Rysand and like it just it's weird to hear her say Resand even though that's the way you're supposed to go about it you know so like it was an interesting take on the audio, you know, either way, doesn't really matter. I did it that way. And besides for that, like, the thing is, is the first time that I read this series, I remember going in so blind. I didn't know what was going on and I just read it for what it was. And the first time that I did read the series, I definitely fell for Tamlin. Like I'm not embarrassed to say that because that happens to a lot of people. And I just did not see the issues with him the first time around. So then when I read like Akamath, I was like, oh my God, I was blown away. I'm like, whoa, like what the hell just happened, you know? And then when I did my reread, I don't really remember like how it felt to reread it so much, but this time around rereading it, like, you know, my third time reading this series um it's just it's a trip like I personally feel like Akatar is kind of like a tease like you know you're reading the book you get into the story you get into it and everything and then all of a sudden like Rysan comes along and then all of a sudden everything blows up and goes in such a different direction and every time that I read the first book I now think of it that way I think of it as such a tease and almost like a waste of time except if you didn't read book one then book two wouldn't mean as much as it meant you know so you gotta read book one to get to book two but then when I read book one I'm like but I just want to get to like, you know, Rysand's moments because like, I really don't care about Tamlin. I absolutely hate him, you know? And it's interesting because I, for a very long time, I was like, oh yeah, I absolutely hate Tamlin. I can't believe I didn't see anything that he did wrong, you know, when I read it for the first time. And now rereading it, I'm like, you know what? I kind of do see how I fell for this. Like I see my thought process as I went through this book because like, you know, he went and he saved her and like, she didn't really know any better. And like, he honestly wasn't acting like that bad of a guy. There were just little tendencies of like, oh yeah, this is totally gonna like get worse as the series goes on. Like, you know, all of his like outbursts and the way that he acts, like it just, it, it elevates as you get further into the series. But like, I don't blame myself for not really realizing that in the first book because you weren't really supposed to realize it. So like, I don't really feel stupid or falling for him the first time, you know? But either way, it's just interesting to like look at book one now that you know where the series is going. I don't, I, I don't really know how else to go about saying that, but like, I hope you get my point. And one thing, 
thing that I find very interesting is that I, I'm not sure when it hit me, but for some reason, I always never really hated Lucian. Like for some reason, I thought that he was like a fine time. Like he was just like a side character and like, you know, he gets more detailed as the book's going on. But I thought that like him and Feyre had a really solid relationship. And now when I read it, it this time around, I'm like, <laughs> no, he is kind of a little sketchy. Like, you know, a lot of the things that happened were because of him. Like the whole thing with, you know, the Suriel and like he didn't come and save her. So therefore she had to make the, you know, the bargain with Rysan. Like it was interesting like I forgot I knew that he like oh yeah I waited half a second before I went and like ran to save you from the cereal like I remember him being like very wary of her but for some reason it, it, it hit me a lot more this time around of like how iffy he is you know like how how much I don't necessarily per se like him and I I was never really a huge fan of him like I don't really like him so much but for some reason this time around I I'm realizing that like I don't like him as much as I even thought I did like him. You know what I mean? Anyway, um, yeah, n nothing really there besides for that. Like, I mean, I love the series. I'm very excited to start Akamath. I actually have it right in front of me and I plan to take this outside with me today because it is absolutely beautiful. I'm going to read it all day. I probably won't get to finish it though because it's like freaking massive, but I'm gonna read it until I finish it. And then I will come back and share with you how this time rereading my favorite book in the entire world went. So I'll be back soon. So I ended up finishing Akamath yesterday. It took me less than two days to read the whole thing. And I had started it via audio because I kind of just wanted to get to the moment where like Rysanne is going to show up at the wedding. So I read the beginning, like the first couple of chapters via audio. Then I jumped to physical. And then I ended up reading like the ending, like the whole hybrid moment, like right after Feyre and Rysanne like secretly got married. I ended up jumping back to the audio just because like, why the hell not? I was like, not in the mood to read it physically. But basically, I'm not sure if I regret that or not. I always enjoy reading this like physically only because like I really like reading it myself you know like it, it's such a fun time it's my, one of my favorite books of all time like I literally love this book from beginning to end the only thing that I'm somewhat regretting a little bit is that I felt the need a little bit to skim only because I do know this book a little bit too well like I know that this is my third round of rereading this series but I've actually read Akamath on the side more than three times I don't know how many times but I know like the first year that like I was reading this series I would randomly pick up Akamath and I would just like skim through it go to like all the favorite scenes like you know the bone carver and then like the moment that like Rysanne was like kneeling and then like you know the weaver and then the summer court and like all of the fun moments like I literally would just like jump like to all of those like fun spots in the book so I have read this book a lot of times and therefore I kind of felt myself skimming a little bit just to get to like the better moments because I kind of know this book inside and out and I don't necessarily regret it but at the same time like I finished it and then all of a sudden I'm like Ugh, I should have just I should have given it a little bit more time like what was the rush you know so I'm somewhat like Ugh, if I would have read it like via audio I wouldn't have done that and even though like all of the stressors would have been a little off and all the names would have been a little off like I feel like it might have been the better move for me only because I am realizing that I am not a good rereader because I remember things a little bit too well, even though like I kind of forget it. The moment that I'm looking at it on the page, all of a sudden everything comes back to me and then I feel the need to skim and then it's like, well, then what's the point of rereading it? You know, like I want to enjoy the story. So I do think that like I really should go ahead and audio book it for, you know, my reread because I think that's the, the way that I will enjoy it more. And also because I already know the story. So listening to it, like from somebody else telling you and even if they're going to stress it and say things differently, like I already know where it's going. So like it's easier to, you know, bring in the audiobook into my brain, if that makes sense. But either way, besides for that, um, I mean, I absolutely love this book. Every single thing about it. It is just so much fun from beginning to end. Like I said, like there, there's so many amazing moments. Like there's the bone carver and then the weaver and then the summer court and then like the whole nightmare scene. And then, you know, when they go under the mountain and then we have Starfall and then we have the end scene and then we have the surreal and then the cabin and then obviously the ending. And I just think like there is so many perfect, perfect moments in this book that like you just don't see that often where from beginning to end, it is just packed, jam packed with fun stuff. Like I don't think there are any lulls in this book. And that is what I very much appreciate. Like I feel like there are other books out there by Sarah J Mass and from other people that were where there's just more boring moments. And in this book specifically, I just don't think there are any boring moments. And that is why it really is one of my favorite books of all time. I also noticed this funny thing because I was listening to it via audio. Um, I always pronounced Ian's name like Ian, but happens to be in the audiobook, they say I am the. And I'm like, how the hell do you read I A N T H E as I am the? Like, I was just like, what? Who are you talking about? And then I realized, like, 
it's Ian. And I just like, I always pronounce the names wrong. Like I just say them how I read them. And like, then people always make fun of me. Like I used to say like hair of fire and everyone's like, it's air of fire, you weirdo. And so like, I've had to like fix how I say things, but I'm still going to say where I stand like till the end of my days. I don't really care if people think it's Reese, it's rise to me. But anyway, besides that, I noticed two interesting things and I have it written down. On page 193, there was like this little sentence and it was like, the prison is law unto itself. The island may even be an eighth court. And I don't want to get deep into conspiracy theories here. Like I am not here to do that. I don't want to make it deep, but I have seen a ton of conspiracy theories and happens to be when I read that sentence, it, it did remind me of a conspiracy theory that I thought of where something about the prison being an eighth court, because somewhere in like a court of silver flames, they go and like, they hear things in the wall or something like that. And then like, there's this entire very 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 long conspiracy theory that I have saved like on my Instagram in like uh, my Saturday mass fan art in case you wanted to go and track it down but I have a like I have it saved somewhere about basically this whole like ins and outs of like people taking like little sentences of how it's possible that the prison is actually an eighth court and how possibly, I don't know how they, like how they connected this, but somehow like Elaine might end up being like the high lady of the eighth court. Like, I don't know where the hell it came from, but it was this whole very long thing. And then when you read it, you're like, holy shit, like people really did their research. And I just happened to have noticed how like they actually said like that the island may be an eighth court. And I never noticed that they literally said it in the book. And that's probably why people started making connections about it and really tried to like, you know, drag it out of the stuff that like Sarah J. Mass like probably like you know sprinkled around in her books but either way I thought it was interesting I also don't really have you know a point in telling you this next thing but on page 360 it said how the tablets were written in Lashon HaKodesh and that they were broken in two and that is why like you know the mortal queens had one half and then the summer court had the other half and I happen to be Jewish and I realized that like uh, Sarah J. Mash was probably saying how like she probably took that information from like the whole idea of like how Moses you know he came down with the tablets and then he saw the whole thing with like the golden calf and then he like split the tablets in two and then they broke and like that's how that's the whole thing with like the broken tablets and it's just interesting because I do know that Sarah J Mass is Jewish like she's like she's been very open about it of how like she's visited Israel and like I know that her husband is Jewish she is Jewish and like I happen to be Jewish and when I read her books like not even these but like Throne of Glass also and and Crescent City like I do notice sometimes how like she puts in like Jewish like history Jewish like philosophy like stuff along those lines because I happen to have grown up like learning a lot about the Jewish stuff and um basically I just it's funny to like see how she says that like Lashon HaKodesh that is the Hebrew language and it's just very interesting how she has taken the idea of like Judaism and like stuck it into her books a little bit like not not a lot but like there are stuff here and there and honestly if I was like more studious I probably could have made more connections but I just thought that that was a very interesting point but either way besides for that that is about all I wanted to share with you so I actually already started on a core wing of ruin I finished ACMAF like halfway through the day yesterday so I just like went straight into ACK war and I'm currently like this far into the book I am at the point where um they're about to go under the mountain again like you know Rysand and fair they were like getting dressed and I just finished like that chapter so we're about to head under the mountain and it happens to be I am reading this one like 100% via audio I'm just like keeping track in the physical book because like why the hell not so anyway that is where I'm at I will come back once I finish that book so I finished A Court of Wing and Rune yesterday, and I am really happy that I ended up going about reading the entire thing via audio, only because I do think that I would have probably ended up skimming a lot of it if I read it physically, only because like I know the story so well, and I don't like this book as much as I like A Court of Mist and Fury, and I have the urge a little bit to do that with A Court of Mist and Fury, so I can only imagine how much worse it would have been for this book. But just like reading it via audio, it totally took away that feeling, and I just like enjoyed it for what it was. And now that I got used to listening to the story via audio, like, like, it totally didn't phase me. Like, at guitar, like, it was okay listening to it via audio, but now I was so used to it. So I actually really enjoyed my listening to this entire book. And, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't love it as much as I like A Court of Mist and Fury, only because, like, this is a war book. And, like, while there are a ton of really fun scenes happening in this book, and, like, I really like seeing Feyre and Rysand, and I like all the side characters and everything along the lines, at the end of the day, everything that they're doing is just to go and, like, defeat Highburn. And I just find it a little bit less interesting than I do 
a chord of mist and fury because like a chord and also the thing is is like a chord of mist and fury is like so perfect in my opinion that like anything that comes after that is just not going to compare so it's like you know we read a chord of mist and fury we absolutely love it and then we come into this book and then all of a sudden like we're seeing the bone carver again and it's just not as fun as of an experience as like seeing him for the first time and then it's like okay we meet the weaver again but it's like but it was so much more interesting to see him her for the first time you know and then it's like okay we go into the library and that's interesting but that's not as interesting as like let's say going to the summer court you know and it's like it's interesting it's just not as interesting and therefore like I can never enjoy it as much as I enjoyed A Court of Mist and Fury so therefore it's like I liked the book but I'm also like very happy I did it via audio because like I probably would have like not enjoyed my experience as much if I read it physically but besides after that I think that the only thing that really bothered me in this book this time around was like the fact that like Feyre is such a nosy body like I always notice this about her and at the end of the day it's like this is a single POV story and yet we're following so many characters so like we have to get to know everybody else's story like some way and therefore like we made Feyre into a nosy body by asking about everybody's drama and every like getting into everybody's business and everything along those lines but like in this book I felt it very much like the fact that like she jumped into Lucian's head to try to see like what was up with him and Elaine and like just the fact that like she's always asking more about Cassian and Asriel and just like she's such like a drama seeker in a sense of like you know in a way that would bother me if it was like in real life like I'm just not so much of like getting into everybody's business but like she had to get into everybody's business so that we can get everybody's business you know what I mean so it's like I understood why but every time that it happened I kind of liked her a little bit less if that makes sense but like Either way, it is what it is. And I happen to think, like, from all the side characters, I think that Asriel is my favorite. And I'm not going to get too deep into this, but I will say that I am an Asriel and Elaine shipper. But besides for Asriel, I also absolutely love the serial. And I feel like we should take a moment just to, like, appreciate him and say goodbye to him. So so freaking sad that he's gone I know right I mean happens to be like he is one of my favorite like creatures out of like all of the things in Sarah J Mass's universe like something about the serial he just he gets me every time you know and happens to be also the weaver I find very very interesting and I noticed this time around that there was something about that like I don't I forgot who said it but it was something about like the fact that she is a death god stuck on their earth and it kind of reminded me about like the death gods in throne of glass so, like there are a bunch of gods in throne of glass that kind of like left everybody to like you know do what they want like they kind of like left all of the people but yet everybody still like uh you know supported the gods in one way or another and happens to be like I'm pretty sure that it was like Elaine a lead and Lorcan who like used to be talked to by some death gods or something like that and it just made me think of like oh are these gods like somehow connected because like in a throne of glass then it's like the gods were like you know they kind of wanted to go back to their world and in this world like the weaver was a death god and she was stuck on this world and I don't really like getting too deep into it in my videos because like there are so many conspiracy theories so many easter eggs that you could look up online and like you know you could just go down a rabbit hole forever but like it is something like really tiny that I noticed about like the fact that like she's a death god and like in throne of glass they name their gods after different things as well like the death god or the healing god or stuff along those lines and like I don't know I just noticed it and I feel like you know connections only because if you read crescent city then you know you know that everything is connected but either way besides for that I think that was about it and my big thing about this series is that I wish that it ended with a court of wing and ruin like this this series kind of makes me appreciate the fact that all other series end when they do you know how, like anytime you finish a book or anytime you finish a series in general it's like you're always hoping like just give me a little bit more give me an extended upload let me just see them happy for a little bit longer and you never really get that you always have to just like imagine it yourself what well, happens to be in this series because we do end up getting an after happily ever after it kind of makes me appreciated a lot more when it, series don't do that because I personally think that this series would have been perfect if it just ended at a court of wing and ruin but it doesn't it does continue and because of that like it just it, I personally think that it kind of ruins the first three books just a little bit like if it would have ended where it ended like if it would have ended right at, a, at the end of a court of wing and ruin I feel like it's like we can just imagine where it's gonna go and like yes obviously they have a lot to still deal with and they're gonna have a lot of problems but like we can just imagine it ourselves like the fact that it continues like I don't know it just it takes away from the specialty in my opinion of the first three books but whatever I mean it is what it is there's nothing I could do about it but like I just I still do wish that like the series possibly ended at a court of wing and ruin but it didn't and because it didn't um we have a court of frost and starlight and st we already have a court of silver flames and we're going to be getting more books but either way I already read
read A Court of Frost and Starlight. It was such a quick and easy read. I started it last night and I finished it this morning. So I'm going to share with you what I thought about that book as well right now. And happens to be, I didn't really think much of it. I think it's just like, I feel like I, I look at that book as like an extended epilogue and I'm just not a huge novella person. So like, I don't necessarily care for the book, but I do appreciate it for what it is. Like, I really like the fact that like, you know, we get to see that, um, you know, they're going to build a house and like they, they want to start a family. And the fact that like, you know, we get that little tidbit of like, we're, um, we're fairy gets all of her dresses. Like there are some really cute moments, but like at the end of the day, I feel like this book was only put there to kind of bridge the gap between the first three books and the next three books, like by seeing only Farrah's POV and then like, you know, going into the future and seeing like other people's POV. So like in this little novella, we got everybody's POV and it's like, I mean, I see what you did there and it was a fine time, but like at the end of the day, it's like, we should have just stopped. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, it's like, this book is just a little bit of fluff, a little bit of fun time. Like we get to see the winter solstice. We get to see a lot of face sand. And like at the end of the day, it was a good time. But like in my head, it's just like a very long extended epilogue. So like, I don't really have much to say about it. I don't dislike it, but like I could have lived without it. But now that we have A Court of Silver Flames, I see how it was necessary. So anyway, I'm going to continue on with reading this series. I'm gonna get started on A Court of Silver Flames today and I'll come back and share with you my thoughts when I'm done with that book. So I finished reading A Court of Silver Flames yesterday and I wanna share with you what I thought about it. So first of all, this is only the second time that I'm reading this book. I read it for the first time last year when it came out and I was doing my reread of the entire series. So this is only my second time reading it. And this time I read it via audio and I'm very happy that I did it that way because I remember the first time that I read it, I found this book to be like very boring in comparison to like regular Sarah J Mass books. And I kind of still felt that way. But when I listened to it via audio, I didn't like feel it as much like because it, you like you were just listening to it. it's like I didn't feel the drag as much but like this is definitely not my favorite Sarah J Mass book in the entire world like first of all like I find that like the majority of this book was like Nesta just working on herself which is a very important thing to read about you know like we don't really see a lot of like mental health stuff in books especially in fantasy books the way that this went and I'm not saying that it was like done badly but I did find the majority of this book boring because like at the end of the day all we did really in like the th first three quarters of it was like go up and down a bunch of stairs work in the library and actually work out and I'm just not so into that specifically like you know we always get to see people working out in books but like we don't get to see that for like chapters on end you know and that was the whole like you know premise of this story so it's like you know, it is what it is, but at the end of the day, it's like, I just don't really care that much to learn about like meditating and yoga and stretching and working out and things along those lines. Like I don't, I don't need to see it on page for like chapters on end. So therefore I didn't particularly love this book. And then also Nesta and Cassian, they are not my favorite like characters in this series at all. They are like on the bottom of the totem pole. Like I just don't necessarily relate to them. Like I'm just not very much a Nesta and Cassian person. So like, I didn't really care for them to get their own book. Like I totally would have taken like an Asriel and Elaine book first, which by the way, I am an Asriel and Elaine shipper over a Gwynriel shipper. And I mean, I already said, I think I said this a little bit before, but like, I'm just going to say it again. Like, first of all, I have been teased about like Gwynriel, like not Gwynriel, El Elriel, you know, I always mix up how to say their names, but I've been like teased about Elaine and Asriel since like Akamath. And like, I have just been rooting for them. And I kind of like the idea of like, we finally get to see somebody who has a mating bond that isn't going to go with the mating bond. Like, wouldn't it be nice to see somebody actually reject it because we've heard all the way in the past of like you know, Rysan's parents weren't really meant to be. And even like Tamlin's parents while they were mated, was Tamlin's parents in love? I don't even remember. But basically like we have seen like people who are mated that weren't really meant to be. So wouldn't it be nice to actually see on paper like somebody who was mated that doesn't end up with each other? Like wouldn't it be nice to see like Elaine and Asriel get together because like even though she has Lucian, like she doesn't really love Lucian or want to be with him. So like then she, therefore she shouldn't. Like why should we push this mating bond on someone who doesn't want it, you know? And like that's only like one reason why I'm kind of like, you know, shipping Elaine and Azrael, but like I also have just been rooting for them and I really like the idea of them and like if this whole bonus scene with like Gwynriel didn't end up happening then like why then this wouldn't really be a thing and that is what bothers me a lot is that there was such an important thing happening in a bonus scene and then it's like it wasn't in everybody's books and not everybody has read it and therefore it's like how can you make such an important entity for like the rest of the series like happen in a thing that like wasn't actually part of the entire book and I've seen like a, a Sarah J Mass do this all the time like she did this with throne of glass like with the air of fire bonus scene there was a scene that then was directly talked
talked about in the later books like multiple times and I'm just like how could you directly talk about something in a book that wasn't actually in everybody's book you know like that very much bothers me also in this book specifically too like there was somewhere in the beginning of the book where like Nessa and Cassian they were they were referenced to like the one of the first times that they met which was in like a court of mist and fury there was a bonus scene for that book where like Cassian went back to like the mortal world or whatever and he ended up having like a conversation with Nesta about the guy that had almost like raped her in something or like something like that and like it was a whole bonus scene I've read it and everything but like then in this book it was directly like mentioned and I'm just like but that not everybody knows that that bonus scene exists so like how can you like I just don't like when she references things in books that weren't in everybody's books that's all I I really feel very strongly about that in like a very negative way like I don't like it and therefore especially that the whole like Gwynriel thing happened because of a bonus scene extra bothers me because it was such an important part to the story and yet it wasn't in everybody's books and therefore it isn't actually physically like you know officially a part of the story and therefore like it really bugs me to no end that like you know all of that happened but either way I am an I am an Elaine and Azriel shipper for more than just those reasons but whatever I'm not necessarily against Gwyn I just don't like particularly care for her you know and like I'm not looking for a love triangle or anything along those lines so like whatever but besides for all of that like there were a lot of things that I noticed this time around in A Court of Solar Flames, like kind of like Easter egg, like, you know, going a little bit deeper into the book that I kind of wanted to share with you, even though I said I wasn't going to make this video too deep, but it was just stuff that like I really noticed without thinking too hard. So I'm going to share with you. And also if you haven't read Crescent City 2, then you might not want to hear all of this, but I already warned spoilers. So I'm not necessarily going to put like a spoiler warning on the, like on the screen because I'm way too lazy to do that. But either way, I'm going to start about talking about these Easter eggs right now. So the first thing I noticed is that there was this very subtle hint of like Rysand's office and how he had this like thing. And it kind of reminded me about the same thing that the, um, the king in Crescent City had in his office that they were mentioned a bunch of times. I forgot what his name is, but like Rune's father had this thing in his office about like kind of looking at like the universe and stuff like that. And I feel like it was the same exact thing that was in Rysand's office that he's had for a very long time. And it just, I feel like it ties in, you know, I mean, obviously it ties in, but I feel like it actually and I feel like they had the same setup you know what I mean so that wasn't explained well but if you know then you know and then also like just very randomly I do think that the harp is definitely going to help Bryce get back home because obviously like you know that is what the harp can do and I think that like you know that is probably why it was like introduced at this moment because she obviously planned all of this stuff and you know I just think that the harp is going to like play a key role in whatever book she writes next and also like very randomly again but Meryl the girl from the library she was researching different worlds and how they overlap and I feel like that is again going to totally circle back to like you know Crescent City somehow and it already circles back to like you know Throne of Glass because at the end of Kingdom of Ash the whole thing with like Aileen going through the world and like how they literally overlap and she was like falling through the world and at one point she even like fell through the like Akatar world because like Rysand helped her descend for a second like I feel like that is totally going to like probably come back somehow because like you know she's literally making like an entire book about the fact that like you know worlds overlap so just very subtle stuff that like you know Sarah J Mash she like puts in there but like it really all is meant to be there for a reason like nothing is random in her books and I just love that every time you read like one of her books like you're always going to pick up on something else that was super subtle that you just never realized that like she put that there for a reason you know what I mean anyway besides for that like um I said this already like a little bit before like when I was talking about the weaver and how she was like a death god but like they basically said again in this book about like how every like the some of the people that were imprisoned in you know the prison is actually like you know they were considered gods and I just feel like it's just very interesting because I, I don't know I really like thinking about it with like throne of glass how they had all of these gods that kind of like left their world and like you know that that was the whole thing with like you know uh Aileen she had to like send them back to their world at the end with the keys and I just feel like are all of these gods from the same world like I don't really know I haven't like really like connected at all but I just feel like when they talk about gods I feel like they're like in all of her series I feel like they're talking about like the same type of gods like from the same place except like all these gods got stuck on different universes somehow you know what I mean I don't know it just trips me out but like that's not a full-on thought and then the last thing that I wanted to share with you again well I kind of already said this but like you know I had mentioned it when I was talking about a court of and fury how like you know the prison is possibly an eighth court but like then we really got into it in this book and I just feel like I wanted to like mention it again because a lot of that like you know um 
uh, what was it called? Like the conspiracy theory that I mentioned when I was talking about Akamath. Like it kind of like, I totally saw it in this moment of like, oh yeah, I see how you made all of those connections. And like, that is definitely an eighth court. And I'm interested to see like how that is going to play out in the future. But like, besides for that, that is kind of all of my thoughts on this book. Like at the end of the day, like I do think that it is an amazing book. Like there are so much, like there's so much to this book and it's so detailed and the way that the magic and the world is going and everything that they're dealing with, the whole idea that like Rysan might become like you know the high lord of everybody like i i like the ideas of where it's going but at the end of the day like i really would not have minded if it ended at akor like let's make it simple like now it's getting like way too deep especially like pulling crescent city into the mix like i'm not a fan of that i've said that when i spoke about like you know my crescent city reviews and stuff like that and like i just don't like it getting too crazy you know like she is amazing sarah jamas is amazing the way that she can go and like make these crazy freaking worlds and connect them and put all these easter eggs like books and books uh, like in front of each other like the way that she thinks this stuff out is obviously insane but at the end of the day it's like let's not make it like too insane let's make it just like a little bit easier you know like let's get some good fantasy let's get some world like world building and magic and like really good romances and like let's be done with it you know like at some points the easter eggs they just stress me out a little bit because like there's so much to look for and it just it gets overwhelming for me a little bit just because like you know I get anxious and anxiety and like then I see all of these you know, conspiracy theories and it just, it all piles up on each other. And like, personally for me, like it just, sometimes it gets to be too much, but at the end of the day, like it also makes it really good. So like, whatever, with that said, um, this is the end of my vlog. I'm going to say like right now, like I do enjoy throne of glass a lot more than I like a court of like, you know, thorns and roses, like all these books, even though I absolutely love this series at the end of the day. But like, I think that one reason why I feel this way is because throne of glass is completed and Akatar is not completed. And I am very much into completed series because I like I was just saying like I like a beginning and an end I like that like anything that's there is there and it's like with this series it's like no but there's so much more that can happen and it's like what else do we not know yet and therefore like it stresses me out and that is why I don't like incompleted series so like if it would have ended an act where I could have liked this so much more but either way um it's not completed for now I'm excited to see who's going to get the next book hopefully it's going to be as your own Elaine but who the hell knows so either way with that said thank you so much for watching if you made it to the end of this video then Oh my God, do I appreciate it. I doubt anybody really cares to listen to me this entire time. But if you did, leave me a comment down below and like maybe leave like, I don't know, a purple heart or like a unicorn or something just so that I know you made it to the end because it would really put an extra smile on my face. But either way, if you did, give this video a like, subscribe if you're not subscribed. Thank you again for watching. I appreciate it. And either way, until next time, enjoy reading.